Can I take this moment to thank each and every one of you amazing supporters? This channel has grown into an incredible community of story lovers, and I couldn't have done it without you guys. If you haven't subscribed yet, please be part of this journey and help us reach new heights. When Mr. Jenkins collapsed right there in front of me, a terror in his eyes as he grasped the rails of his bed. It will haunt me forever. The cardiac alarm screeched as his vital signs plummeted and doctors rushed in, but the frantic resuscitation attempts could not bring him back. I'll never forget watching his last desperate breaths fade, his face still twisted in fear and confusion at his abrupt ending under the harsh hospital lights. In 15 years as an ICU nurse, I've lost patience, but something in witnessing this particular elderly man's panic shook me hard. He had only been admitted that morning for minor breathing issues that seemed manageable. Chatting pleasantly about his garden through my intake assessment, he showed no indications of imminent decline. But just past midnight, I found him struggling for air, saying he had a vice on his chest. Moments later, he was gone, his heart giving out with no warning. In the week following, the mental playback of Mr. Jenkins's death constantly crept into my thoughts. The image of his horrified eyes burned into my own. Sleep eluded me most nights as I rechecked details from that case, trying to understand how he slipped away so fast. But the doctor's notes confirmed no prior cardiac condition. It made little sense. My restless fixation soon invaded work itself, passing down a long fourth floor hallway. I found my gaze invariably drawn to glimpses inside room 422 from the nursing station windows. I shrugged it off as just a familiar visual landmark my brain now assigned to the traumatic end I witnessed there. Late one night, a few weeks later, I left the nurse's station to stretch my tired legs as I endlessly wandered the dead quiet corridor, lost in thought. I came upon room 422 again. The door stood closed, bed empty and dark within. Or so I believed, until movement in my periphery made me pause mid-step. I froze, peering into the shadowed room. I could have sworn I saw the shape of a patient shuffle across the sliver of light inside, as if they had pulled back the privacy curtain. Circling the bed, I definitely spotted a silhouette lumber slowly between the bed rails and the bathroom door, like an elderly person dependent on walkers or canes. Shivers trickled down my neck. That certainly looked like a person wandering inside room 422. But of course, no patient had been assigned to this room since Mr. Jenkins died. My overtired brain must be playing games, I told myself. Apprehension rising, I slid my keycard through the lockbox and cracked open the heavy door. I swept the flashlight beam over every inch of floor space. The neatly made vacant beds stood untouched corners tightly tucked, various machines for monitoring vitals, all powered down and invocant. No signs of use or human presence besides myself, of course. No one here anymore, watching me from inside. Soft strains of the big band music he favored seemed to follow me at the nurse's station late at night. Multiple times, I nearly dropped patient binders after spotting Mr. Jenkins out of the corner of my eye, hovering solemnly beside his former room. But each time I spun around to look, only empty space remained. My rational brain fought acknowledging. I gradually came to accept the ghost of Mr. Jenkins occupied our floor, appearing randomly to me alone. Why he seemed bound to that room 
and intent on connecting only with me remained a mystery. A year later, I transferred off that unit, unable to withstand the intermittent manifestations, escalating from fleeting to frightful. A crashing code card slammed, rolling across the hall toward me before stopping abruptly inches away and writing itself mysteriously. Supply cabinets shaken violently as I walked past, but worst of all, the touch, like icy, skeletal fingers, probing gently at the tender inside of my wrist while sitting, doing late night charting alone. My compassion for that frightened elderly man compelled me to silently accept his spectral presence at first, but the encounters worsened preaching polite ghost protocols, my supervisor skeptically dismissed the stories. Therapists suggested anxiety and grief counseling. I begged for help making sense of it all. In my soul, however, I knew Gerard Jenkins reached out for a reason as he expired that midnight. Perhaps I was the last one promising him comfort in those final, terrifying moments of forced crossing. I wonder still, about souls stranded in death by pain and confusion, searching for those anchors from life who last held their gaze. But I cannot allow my living breath to chain me permanently to that spectral ground any longer. Enough energy remains bound up in that old hospital room, its essence too entwined with my mind in ways I no longer need to understand or justify. The hauntings persist among those fluorescent halls, but I persist now in realms of the living, free from the grip it once held me in so tight, working the graveyard shift as a security guard at the Royal. Certainly, here's the continuation and improvement of the transcription. Imagination, but this was different. Most nights, I hurry past on my scheduled walks, avoiding more than a quick glance at the solid gray door sealing the downstairs room where newly dead bodies await transport. Something about picturing the lifeless forms lying below my feet, the very life essence still dissipating from their cooling flesh as I stride obliviously overhead stirred a primal discomfort no amount of reasoning could shake. But one 3 a.m. round had me slowing my brisk footsteps. A faint yet distinct metallic bang echoed from the end of the empty hall where that foreboding entrance stood. I paused, peering into shadows, trying to make sense of such a heavy, solid noise arising from a room typically still and silent as death itself, the knowing discomfort stirring. I used my master key to unlock the morgue suite, hitting switches to flood the stark white halls with light. My paling heart sounded thunderous in the subterranean quiet as I crept toward the bay of drawers lining the back wall. The final resting spots for bodies before rides to the funeral home. Was it possible some unstable drawer had come loose on its tracks, crashing open forcefully? I crept along slowly, shining my flashlight into each refrigerated chamber through the small viewing windows. The heavy steel boxes were all latched tight, bodies shrouded neatly under crisp sheets just as I always studiously avoided glimpsing. On rare occasions, I had reason to enter this place, about to chalk it up to overtired auditory hallucinations in such an inherently morose space. I wheeled suddenly at the distinct sound of shuffling footsteps behind me. My flashlight beam sliced through the brightly lit yet empty room. Of course, no one else should possibly be down here. Morticians and transport drivers never arrived until daylight hours when administration offices were staffed. Heart pounding, I gave the 
place of final sweeping inspection, trying to rationalize the noises until a new sound whispered suddenly right at my ear, an unintelligible muttering, guttural and intense. I cried out, stumbling back, my flashlight clattering sharply to the polished floor and spinning under metal tables as I fled blindly through the maze of gurneys and equipment. I didn't slow my panicked pace until safely sealing that looming door upstairs behind me in the relative comfort of the night floor nurse's station. Through choked gasps, I relayed the bizarre occurrence to a pair of startled nurses who urged me to report the incident immediately in daylight. Rationality crept in. Creepy morgue happenings could be blamed on exhausted senses and an overactive, indulging in the imagination of things that go bump in the night. But seeing those nurses indulge nervous glances toward that closed stairwell reinforced this went beyond tricks of an entire mind. In the unsettling week that followed, three bodies from entirely different cases came through missing the same oddly specific organs. After transport from our hospital morgue to funeral homes, the baffled coroner could find no reasonable medical or procedural explanation for two livers and one heart somehow absent from unrelated corpses under close containment. My spine prickled. Considering similarities too unnatural to ignore, bodies robbed inexplicably of organs, disappearing post-mortem while our morgue hosted incidents beyond understanding, coming barely a week after that gruesome whisper, still echoing hauntingly in memory, as a guarded presence trusted throughout the hospital. I couldn't share flimsy theories about ghoulish organ thieves stalking the lower depths at night, but my internal security protocols mandated further attempts investigating disturbances in the name of safety. So, the next week when 3 a.m. rolled around without a sound, down below, I descended, repressing relentless dread. My intention was conducting an informed inspection, now better prepared if anything seemed amiss. But the air varied, exiting the elevator. At such profound wrongness, I halted, frozen, gazing into that open morgue suite. The space appeared unchanged, except around a certain body drawer. I stood too far back to read the ID tag number, but it hovered in the amorphous density, chillingly unlike floating dust particles. Frozen in the open chamber doorway, all ability to scream or even breathe failed when that malevolent entity gradually formed into a figure whose eyes burned suddenly into mine, bright and knowing. It held my panic stare for an eternity before dissolving abruptly into the drawer and pulling it closed with a reverberating slam that finally that she was the ghost of a nurse from a bygone era. Others deemed her a harbinger of impending doom. I convinced myself that these occurrences were merely the result of overworked minds and a building steeped in history. However, my skepticism began to crumble as the phenomena escalated. During a particularly harrowing night shift, I was called to respond to a code blue in the oncology unit. As I rushed towards the room, dread coiled in my stomach. Room 315 again. The whispers and tales had woven a tapestry of fear around that room. And now, a patient was fighting for their life within its walls. The elderly patient, who had been relatively stable earlier, lay in distress. Medical equipment scattered, the room a tableau of chaos. It was as if an unseen force had erupted from the shadows, wreaking havoc. 
patient, barely conscious, mumbled about the vintage nurse hovering ominously before the sudden deterioration. As the days unfolded, the incidents multiplied. Patient's health inexplicably declined after encounters with the spectral nurse. The room became synonymous with dread, and no one wished to occupy its beds. The once slow evenings turned into a parade of unsettling events, crashes in the night, mysterious injuries, and the pervasive smell of an antique anesthetic that defied logical explanation. During inventory checks at 3 a.m., a cold shape materialized suddenly in my periphery by the glittering IV poles. Startled, I spun to confront what couldn't be, only to find indistinct features fading back into nothing by the vital sign monitor. An expanse of empty floor lay in front of room 315, but not before my senses registered the clawing smell of the antiquated anesthetic phased out long before my years here due to flammability and toxicity, yet its phantom trace remained, swirling through room 315, along with muted glimpses of a visitor not of this earthly plane. Who she was, or why she seemed compelled to keep vigil only at certain early hours inside identical numbered rooms, regardless of the unit, remained unfathomable. Some morbidly joked, room 315. Rumors circulated that a nurse, trapped in time, had died in that room ages ago, still making her rounds, not realizing she now existed only in spectral form. However, her essence carried malice more darkly ominous than quaint hauntings of lore. Unable to deny the damage she inflicted on unsuspecting patients once midnight struck, I helped authorize priests brought in for blessings, concealed as maintenance visits, but phenomena continued escalating as years passed from fleeting to flagrant. Crashes and banging erupted frequently around 3 a.m. inside the spiteful room, sitting empty. Mysterious black molds bloomed intensely on ceiling tiles and inside cabinets until teams in hazmat gear came scrambling. And worst of all, sudden unexplained codes crackling urgently over the speakers for seemingly stable occupants of beds in the cursed room 315. My compassion burned for those victims who unknowingly put their recovery and very lives at risk by admit orders assigning them to the ominous room. It became a puzzle with missing pieces, a riddle without a solution. The whispers in the hospital corridors grew louder, and the uneasy glances of the staff became more pronounced. Attempts to quell the malevolent force proved futile. Exorcisms and blessings yielded only temporary reprieves. The nurse's vengeful spirit persisted, undeterred by the efforts to cleanse the room of its ominous aura. As the hospital grappled with this paranormal ordeal, staff turnover increased and morale plummeted. Those brave enough to confront the spectral nurse found themselves entangled in a web of supernatural malevolence. A dark chapter unfolded within room 315, leaving an indelible mark on the hospital's history. The once bustling hallway outside that room now echoed with a chilling silence, as if the very walls mourned the anguish held within. And so, the legend of room 315 continued to weave its tale of horror and despair, a haunting reminder that some entities linger beyond the veil of life, their presence casting a shadow on the living. The deadly spaces bearing those three fateful digits, having witnessed evil 
unlike any earthly diseases, take hold in ways no medicine can combat. Now I too hurry past both wings, avoiding room 315, not daring to gaze within. Even as strange rhythmic noises echoed dangerously from behind closed doors. As day nurses begin arriving, I have stood frozen in those rooms, while cries for help resonated straight through my soul at the sight of that entity and her swirling malevolence. No living being deserves confinement at the whims of such darkness, not just to avoid census issues or insurance mandates. Let room 315 remain quarantined for whatever haunts reside there, alone, until the light of day spills in to offer fleeting safety once more. Thanks for listening in. If you like these stories and want to hear more, then please subscribe and like and support this new channel. We have more stories for you to listen to.